completely agree. If you can get the seller on the phone, you're going to speed things up dramatically. And you're going to find out why they're actually selling because the broker is never going to tell you. So. Yeah. And, and to your point, you know, the, the electronic communication drives me nuts. Oh, it's, I, it drives me nuts. Your, your electronic communication in this day and age should be for the sole purpose of driving them to the phone. Hello, everybody. This is Jake Senzian, host of Wilbur Profits Podcast, here with my co-host, the multifamily mentor, the coach, chef, the father, six, the best-selling author, the G-Daddy, Gino Barbo. Gino, how's it going? Mr. Stenziano, I am doing great today. We've got another awesome guest, something that we should always be speaking about is negotiation. Right now, I'm trying to negotiate maybe another child, but I don't think that's in my, <laughs> that's in my story right now. I'm, I'm hoping for you, though, bro. You got you, your wife is negotiating with you. Hopefully, she pulls that one through, right? Oh, man, that's going to be a tough <laughs> negotiation. But hey, let's not, let's not hold this up anymore. Today's guest is Derek Gunn. Derek is the author of Ego Authority Failure and a trainer with 29 years of law enforcement experience. He is a hostage negotiation expert who frequently speaks at hostage negotiations and SWAT conferences across the country. So without further ado, Derek, welcome to the show. Guys, thank you for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here. Hey, it is our pleasure. Tell us how you got started in negotiations. I, you know, it's not the kind of thing that uh, you, you seem like you can just go to college for. So this, I'm sure you have an interesting story there. Yeah, so I, I started my law enforcement career in 88. Um, about then, and, and this was back in the days where crack was king. Uh, cities were being overrun with this crack cocaine epidemic, and so um, it was about 18 months before I switched to from a patrol assignment to a narcotics assignment. And during the time I was in narcotics, um, we found that most of the drug related crimes had a a property crime or a crime of violence nexus. And so these people were constantly trying to minimize their exposure to the judicial system by giving information on property crimes or, or the location of a gun or, or giving us the name of somebody who shot somebody else. And so that provided an opportunity for me to hone my interview and interrogation skills. Um, and I knew that I could say specific things in a specific manner to elicit a specific response from these people. And um, I knew that there was something more out there. I knew I could take that psychological aspect of getting information from other people and take it to another level. And that was when I was first drawn to the concept of hostage negotiation. So fast forward nine years, 1997, I applied for and was selected to the hostage negotiations team. Uh, 2001, I became the team leader. 2004, I became the team commander. And that's a, a position I held up until I punched out. So why'd you punch out? <laughs> <laughs> it was time. You know, I, I had done my time in law enforcement. Uh, the environment has clearly changed. Um, and it was the right time for me to go because I started to, I started to get jaded. There were some things that occurred within my agency that I wasn't happy with, one of them directly to me. Um, and so when, tw when the 25, when the 25 years came up, I pumped out, walked across the street, got hired by another law enforcement agency. And I was with them for three years before Chris called and said, uh, you know, uh, I could use you on a full-time basis. That's awesome. So what do you love about negotiation? Um, I love, as I said before, being able to say things in a specific manner to elicit a specific response. I love being able to show my counterpart that I'm not thinking about myself. I'm not thinking about my goal and objective. I'm trying to first view the lay of the land as they see it and then move towards whatever my goal and objective is. One of the, one of the examples I like to use is um, my goal and objective as a hostage negotiator is to do what? Get the hostages released, get the guy to surrender, right? You know that, I know that, the guy, if he was taken out of those circumstances, would know that as well. How many times do you think I'd led with that on my first phone call inside of the crisis site? <laughs> Wouldn't go I call, yeah, I call on the site inside and I say, hey, Gino, it's Derek from the police department. Listen, my goal and objective is to get everybody out safely, so why don't you put the gun down, let those people go and come on out. <laughs> you try that though, right? <laughs> And I never started with that because they're not ready to hear that yet. 
And that's a lot, that's the way a lot of business negotiations get started. They, people want to go in and throw their goal and objective on the table and, and all of this data and information and say, here's why you should make this decision. And the other side says, wait a minute, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to do it. We get pushback and we can't figure out why. And it's simply because the sequencing is wrong. Sequencing. Wow. So let me ask you, what do you hate about not negotiation? You just got something that you don't like about it. Um, I, I hate being forced or bullied into a position. I hate people who use the word no simply because it's what's born in some fruit in the past and they beat you about the head and shoulders with it without any real reason why mm -hmm. you're saying no. Um, but that, that would be the only thing. And when I say I hate that, I hate it because it, it causes me to work harder. Mm -hmm. Right. And you know, I, I'd rather work smart and not work as hard. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, I, I feed off of the old style negotiator because they, they, they've never been exposed to our stuff and they think that they can beat our stuff with archaic principles that were developed 20 years ago that have not been improved. Wow, that leads me to my new qu next question. I was going to go somewhere else. We're going to talk with the three types of negotiators. The no one is, it sounds like the assertive one that he wants to assert himself just because that's his type. And I guess you have to know the sequencing for that type of person, correct? Well, the sequencing is the same. This is, this is the beautiful thing about it. It's the human nature response. And all of us are susceptible to these skills because we're all human beings. The level, the impact is without question. These skills impact everybody. What may be debatable is the level of impact mm -hmm. that each person has because we all have different constitutions. Now, the assertive person is, that's the first of the three types. You know, each of the three types has something as important to them as making the deal. And for the assertive, it's to be heard and respected. So what do you think I'm going to do when I meet up with an assertive person? I'm going to sit back and let them run the show. And I'm going to feed back to them exactly what they're giving to me, but I'm going to let them have control of the orchestra for, for the most part, uh, because that's, that's what they want. And let me ask you, in hostage negotiations, do you see that a lot? I mean, people have a gun, they want to be significant, they want to have the strength. So is that, is that what you find in a lot of uh, negotiations with hostages? Yeah, are they assertives? Or does it depend? It, it depends. Most of them are not assertives. Okay. Really? Okay. Yeah. Most of them feign assertiveness, mm -hmm. but that is an emotional response to a highly stressed event that they did not plan for. Mm -hmm. And so it throws them into a state of crisis. When we get thrown into a state of crisis, we've, we've got no cognitive maps to help us deal with the crisis. And so they do the most expedient thing. And that is, you know, yell, scream, curse, wave a gun around and snatch hostages. You, you know, and I know that the quickest way to get the police to leave you alone is not to grab a hostage, mm -hmm. but they do it all the time because that is the only response that they can see because their, their cognitive ability has been diminished because of the crisis. Mm -hmm. So the second one would be the accommodator. How, uh, how would, how would you work with an accommodator? The accommodator is all about relationships. I'm going to make the accommodator feel respected, liked, and heard. What's as important to the accommodator, what's more important than the deal for the accommodator is the relationship. So I'm going to do, uh, I'm going to go overboard with um, demonstrating that I get where they're coming from because they're, uh, appreciation of reciprocity is a lot higher than the other two. And if I quickly show them that I get where they're coming from, they're quickly going to, going to show me where, um, that they understand where I'm coming from, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And with the accommodator, you got to be very careful with the accommodator because relationship is so important for them. They will tell you yes and not mean it. So with the accommodator, you got to test that yes with implementation questions over and over again. We had one accommodator tell us in a group setting that um, you can't believe everything that we say, but we're not intentionally trying to lie to you. Now get your head around that. I'm like, no, it what? makes sense. 
You can't believe everything we say, but we're not intentionally trying to lie to you. And so the accommodator is very difficult to deal with on implementation. You've got to really make them explain how the agreement is going to look. They don't want to disappoint you. So they'll yes you to death, but they won't. Then when it comes for the rubber to hit the road, they'll say, Oh, I don't know. Right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And then the third would be the analyst, right? Mm -hmm. And what's as important to an analyst as making a deal is data and information. If they overload, come out, dude, overload. We get through them every day. It's like they analyze something, they analyze a deal, they analyze it again, and they're like, they're like just paralyzed. Hey, years, right, Gina? Yeah. Wow, dude. The deal is good. Just do the deal, and they just go back <laughs> and they make an excuse, and they need a partner to push them through that thing, or else they're never going to get it done. Yeah, and it's it's all about does their does the information they're being presented line up with what they already know? That's what they're looking for, and if it doesn't. There are, there are going to be problems. So, so patience is of the essence with, um, with the analyst because they will blow up a deal as long as they, they come out smarter, as long as they got information that they didn't have going in. Um, and so with them, I, I love to use comparison analysis. They love, to, they love to explain how they got to where they are. And so I let them run the table with um, comparing my information with theirs. Mm-hmm. They're, wow. they're skeptics, right? Yeah, they're, they're, they're skeptics, uh, especially when it comes to um, giving first, right? If you give first to an analyst, they're gonna, you're going to put them on guard. They're going to be hyper defensive. They're going to be like a, a river rat backed into a corner. I don't know if you've ever seen a river rat, but they're huge and they're nasty. And you back one into a corner. Sounds gross. Can't say it's a <laughs> It will rate. Uh, think of. Um, Think of a possum with, with, with dreadlocks. <laughs> That's what they look like. But, um, you know, if you, if, you, if you give first to an analyst and they didn't ask for it and they didn't plan for it, you're going to put them on the defensive. It, that's, that's tantamount to call them, calling them a liar. Now they're going to shut down and try to figure out what's the angle. Why did Jake give me that? Oh, you're always selling me. That's what it is. Why is Jake selling me? Why did he give me that? <laughs> ah, I see. That makes so much sense now. I never thought of it that way. I like that. That's, that is good. Um, you said old stuff, new stuff. What do you see the difference between the old type of um, negotiating as, as opposed to what you guys have learned in the last 20 years? What stands out to you? What stands out is um, the concept of win-win, it's been thrown around forever and a day and it drives me nuts because there is really no win-win. There's win more and win less, but there is no win-win. And the win-win is it's a concept that's based primarily on logic. And human beings are illogical to our core. We make decisions based on how we feel. And, and when emotions are brought into it, and that amygdala gets fired up because of negative emotions, it's hard for people to process. It's harder for them to think. And, and win-win is a thinking concept. Um, BATNA jumps out at me. Best alternative to a negotiated agreement because it implies that you're ready to take less than what you're going in, than what you're going in thinking about. Mm -hmm. You're talking about compromising your position before you even got to the table. Um, and in the world that we're from, there was no compromise. You know, I, I, I couldn't, you know, I, the guy tells me I want a, a, I want a, um, I want ginseng root from a thousand year old ginseng plant and a troop helicopter to fly me and my comrades to Thailand. You think he's going to get either of those things? So I got a deal with him, with his emotions, with his demand and not give in to any of that to make him comply. And Would the ultimately, wind be like a ginseng tea though? <laughs> or is he not going for that? It's win or win less. He didn't ask for He's ginseng winning less, tea. right. He got asked, it. He, he asked for the root. Yeah. So I mean, he, CVS has got the ginseng tea. We might be able to get you that far, pal, but we're not, you're not, you're getting all the way there. So I got you. But, it, but again, that's, that's an example of when 
less. or win less, win more, yeah. win less. Um, and at the end of the day, um, you guys are like what I was as a hostage negotiator, believe it or not. You are compliance professionals. You sell a good or a service and you try to get people to what? To buy, i.e. comply, right? As a hostage negotiator, I was the ultimate compliance professional because I sold jail time and I got people to buy it all of the time. <laughs> I like that. Can you give us a story? I should have started at the beginning. Any, any stories that stick out as far as hostage negotiations that went well? Anything that like really you really did? Wow, that's something this story really just sticks in my mind. Oh, did well. Um, and that's a relative term, not getting, not getting anybody. Someone, right. someone, right. someone lived, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, fortunately for me, most of them lived. Um, so that's win our, more then. <laughs> our success or failure is never really predicated on whether or not um, the bad guy lives or dies, right? That's not how I measure success. Uh, I measure success by being able to answer yes to two questions. Did the people that I was sent there to protect go home? Did all of my guys go home? And if I answer yes to both of those, I'm good. I agree with that logic because that person put themselves in a situation where they're putting other lives at risk. So they've devalued their, they've devalued their life. So I, I completely agree with your position there. Yeah, Jake. And at the end of the day, bad guy at any moment during this event can put the gun down and walk out and nothing physically is going to happen to him. Yep. So you're right. He's the ultimate arbiter as to how it ends. Mm -hmm. But back to, back to your questions, you know, probably yeah, my first, you, you never forget your first. Right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's getting juicy. <laughs> um, I was dealing with a, 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 a suicidal jumper on a bridge uh, in November and uh, we worked that job for about six hours. This is DC. Yeah. yeah. So it's cold out too. So it was, it was, it was freezing. It was an old bridge. So uh, as traffic would travel by us, it would undulate quite a bit more than normal. Uh, we were in the flight path of Reagan national airport. So it made communicating with this guy very difficult. Um, and he was, a what we call in the business a swami a suicide with other motivations that's your new word from law enforcement suicide with other motivation <laughs> we got a new one <laughs> who cares what motivation is you want to kill himself right <laughs> is, is, is the it, well here's the thing suicide with other motivations is a guy or a woman who engages in suicidal behavior for purposes other than the suicide mm -hmm. so they're 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 trying yeah. to manipulate somebody mm-hmm um, and so those are, those people are tricky to deal with because when they f finally realize that the jig is up, the ultimate act of control, which is what they were after to begin with is to yes. actually do it. Themselves, yeah. So I, I, I still have to work it the way I would any other suicide attempt. So he was, he was a handful. We found out, um, uh, the day prior that, um, one of my, teammates, one of my other negotiators had been negotiating with as he hopped from payphone to payphone in the district of Columbia, trying to get him to turn himself in uh, because a warrant had been issued from his arrest and he was having a great time with it. He actually made recordings of all the phone calls. Uh, the, uh, he was, it was a violation of a protective order from his estranged wife. She was afraid to stay in the house. So she moved out with a friend and so we thought because of his nature that he may come back to the house. And so we put two officers inside the house. And this is, this goes to support our calling him a Swami and a master manipulator. He sneaks into the back porch of the house. He looks in the window. He sees the two cops in the house. He sneaks back off of the back porch. He goes down to a grocery store. He buys a platter full of cheese and fruit and a bottle of wine. He goes back to the house. He slides it up on the back porch. He goes down the street. He calls the police department and says, hey, tell the two cops that are in the house. I left them a gift out on the back porch. <laughs> this guy's got too much time in his hands. That's what I think. He's not a swami. He's an idiot. If you ask me. 
Yeah, he, he, he did say some things that, that, that indicated that. But, um, <laughs> yeah, after seven hours up on the bridge. Dude, uh, just we, jump. Just get it over with. That's what I want to say, bro. Yeah, yeah that's what that, everybody that was driving by was saying that. That's why we had <laughs> that's like, well, Up in the Northeast, I, I mean, I mean after the bridge, it's like, dude, <laughs> it's with. Christmas time. Thank, tur- I want turkey, man. Get, I got to get home. You know what I'm saying? So yeah, that's, that's got to be a hard job in and of itself because you're, really root- you're not really rooting for this guy. That's the problem, right? You're just like, come on, you know? I'm just I'm just there to do a job, but I know that the bosses above me are under intense pressure to get that bridge open up because yeah. it was the 95 corridor. Man, there was nothing moving north or south mm-hmm. from Virginia to Maryland at that. So point. everyone wants him to jump. <laughs> <laughs> we <And> to win. <laughs> at the end of the day, he eventually did. He got he got Ugh. he got shot in the behind with a uh, a less lethal round, and as they moved in to grab him, he. He flipped over the edge. He goes into the water. But we had we had moved him uh, from his original perch, probably 150 yards down the bridge, where it was mostly silt at the bottom. Um, the impact was going to be a lot less because he was closer to land, um, and he wound up surviving. So no kidding. Uh, yeah, it was a good good ass shot then. <laughs> yeah, it, it, well, I mean, it, I would have liked to known number one that it was coming because it surprised me and number two i would like to have seen multiples but uh, they just didn't move fast enough in fact one of them i I don't know if it was one of them or the swat guys or if it was one of our negotiators but over my shoulder i heard somebody say grab him what i'm not grabbing him If he if he goes, he's going by himself. I'm not going for a swim. You know, did you guys not have like the Batman, the net shooter yet, where like a shoot out a net and pull him down? Uh, yeah, you know, there's there's so many different tools. But the the interesting thing um, about this event is, um, it occurred. The first third of that bridge belongs to the state of Virginia. The last third of the bridge belongs to the state of Maryland. The middle portion of the bridge where he initially started belongs to the District of Columbia. That's so we had itself. we had those three jurisdictions converging on this one on this one event. To the credit of the Metropolitan Police Department, they said, you guys have already quote locked in with this guy. We're gonna let you have it. But if there's any arrest <laughs> <I didn't want laughs> it. <laughs> I, if there's any arrest, if there's any tactical intervention, it's going to be with our guys. So you got negotiators from one team working with the SWAT team from another agency. Uh, the communication was choppy, as you might imagine. Um, so that was another challenge. But all in all, the guy lived. He got How locked many feet up. Did he fall? Uh, when he finally hit the water, he probably fell 30, 35 to 40 feet. Oh, that's nothing. Uh, not a big jump. So you, yeah, guys, you, I, you guys wanted to go home. So you popped him in the ass and said, get off. And we're going, okay? <laughs> After seven hours, they said, you know, <laughs> we, we pretty much had enough because he was starting to, you know, he was starting to vacillate again. Once we got him, the, 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 the uh, motivation for him was we've got your son. He's down at police headquarters. We'll let you see him, but you got to come off the bridge. And as he got closer and closer to the end of the bridge, he started to, to him and ha again. And, and so that's uh, when the decision was made. So Derek, I think information, our uh, first tip is information is key in any negotiation, just like any business or any, any venture, you're trying to take a deal down, trying to buy a, mom, a deal from a mom and pop. You need to know what their motivation is. You need to know what information is there. And that, that's key. Would you say that that's really important? You, you hit the nail on the head in that motivation, motivation, motivation is the key. You look at these negotiations with the black swan method as, information gathering ventures in order to establish rapport, build trust-based influence, and then get them to change their behavior. Um, many times we get hung up on the no. They said, no, cut your price or I'm going to a competitor. Do this or else. Give me a raise or I walk. I need this by X date or deal is off. And we get, we start freaking out and we start thinking, how are we going to get out of this? And I'm asking you to start thinking about it from a different angle in that you want to find out what the motivation behind the threat or the demand or the no is because people anywhere on the planet would tell you yes, 
if they felt like it. If they tell you no, it's born out of fear and it's born out of mistrust. And that's what you have to attack. Not the fact that they said no. Why did they say no? Mm -hmm. What are they afraid of? Why have I not established enough trust so that I take away the uncertainty? Because those are the two big drivers, finding out the motivation, and that involves gathering information. I'd rather spend 20 minutes on the phone with somebody than doing two months of due diligence and research because I'm going to find out things in that conversation that are not public knowledge, that are driving their behavior. So that's why you get on the phone. You don't text people, everybody. I mean, the people nowadays don't want to pick up the phone. Body language is key. I like doing a call here. Just, just listening to a pe person's tone. Uh, go ahead, Jake. I'm sorry. No, no. I want you to finish your thought. I was just saying that anytime that we're dealing with a bro there's a broker involved in a real estate deal. When we actually get to speak to the seller, you literally, it's, you hit fast forward on information gathering and the clarity of the picture becomes so much uh, uh, better, so much sooner. The broker will tell you little bits and pieces. Yeah. The minute you get the seller on the phone, it's just literally the floodgates open up and the, the picture becomes crystal clear. So I just wanted to you know, comment on his point. You'll find out more about the motivation. You'll find out what's really going on because they'll open up where the broker is typically tight to the vest and will only drip feed what they feel is needed. So I, I completely agree. If you can get the seller on the phone, you're going to speed things up dramatically. And you're going to find out why they're actually selling because the broker is never going to tell you. So. Yeah. And, and to your point, you know, the, the electronic communication drives me nuts. Oh, it's, it drives me nuts. Your, your electronic communication in this day and age should be for the sole purpose of driving them to the phone or driving them to a, to like a face to face. Um, and, and so many times you'll get an email and, and the, the, the counterpart's entire position is laid out in that email. And so think about, think about if you play chess that way, would you actually put in your next seven contemplated moves in an email? The answer would be no. So in, in the, in the, um, in the vein of playing chess, I may make, uh, send a one line email with my next move and, and end it. That's it. Because those long emails turn people off and a long email will give them an opportunity to find the one or two things that they disagree with. And that's all they're going to focus on in their response to you. Well, Derek, so, it's funny you say that Jake won't go through more than one or two line emails. So I don't, I won't send them one. That's I just can't one. read. That's why <laughs> I know that that doesn't work with Jake. So, um, uh, this has been awesome. So we're talking about what you should do. What are some mistakes you see that negotiation negotiators do or that happen in negotiation? I know ego is a big one. So that's like check your ego at the door emotions. But what are the mistakes you see um, happening in, let's say, real estate deals or in just business deals itself? Um, real estate deals. Not keeping the client abreast of what's going on, even if nothing is going on. They, they have the same psychological makeup as a kidnap victim. As so emotional. Victim. It's, it's, it, they're over the top with emotion. Yeah. And a lot of that emotion is driven by uncertainty. They don't know when it's going to end. <laughs> and that's what they really want to know. When is this going to end? And when they can't predict what it's gonna, when it's going to end, it puts them into a state of crisis. So one of the big mistakes, especially in real estate, is not keeping them abreast, even if you've got nothing to tell them. Hey, I had the open house on Sunday. Nobody came through. I just wanted to let you know we got no news, but we're still working. That, as opposed to not telling them anything. You leave them hanging over a barrel, you're going to drive them nuts, and you're going to increase their emotional state, and their ability to hear you is going to be um, diminished. Generally speaking, I said it earlier in the call, sequencing is, is the biggest problem. It's the biggest problem. So in simple, in the simplest terms, it's, it's always tactical empathy first, your goal and objective last. And there are many steps and there's a lot of dialogue in between those two. Uh, but you want to put where you want to end up on the back part of the conversation. I coach my clients and tell them the first 80% of any conversation is not going to be about you or where you want to go. It's going to be all about them. It's so important to be able to subordinate yourself to your counterpart. And it's hard to do because nobody's told you to do that before. It's, it's counterintuitive and therefore it's awkward. And when we're awkward, 
we're uncomfortable. And when we're uncomfortable, what we want to do more than anything else is get comfortable again. And that's rush. I'm going to rush. I don't know where this conversation is going. So I'm going to jump right into where I want it, want it to be. And that's where we find a lot of stumbles. Well, I've got a lot of stuff here, Jake. First thing is it's going to be hard to do what Derek said because he was a hostage negotiator. It's nearly not about you. So he was trained to do that. You want to know what the guy or the lady on the other side wants. You're, what you want is really irrelevant because he can kill people. Um, and it's hard because we're in an instant gratification world. So people want, and, and I'm with that with the real estate. Dude, the building's worth a million bucks. Let's not fool around. Just the, I'll give you a million, you give me the building. But that's not how it works. And unfortunately, if you can't wrap your mind around it, find another occupation because it really is not about that instant gratification. You're going to be patient and comfortable being uncomfortable. Yes. I know it's so cliche to say, but there's so much power in that. You got to just be able to hang in there. Yeah. And I think the other thing is everyone should pick up the book, Same Side Selling, Finding Impact Together. Because I think that's what Derek is talking about in a selling sort of way, because you're trying to find impact together. You're trying to, you know, same side sell. Or work. How can we work together? What, what are your needs and what are my needs to see if we can work together? That's a way that you can uh, work on negotiation, work on selling. So, and I think the other key was communication. Um, when we have investors, we're going through, we've bought a deal, we're on month three, we're on month four, even if there's nothing happening, just get in a webinar with your investors, let them know that, you know, we've turned three apartments, we've built a dog park, we've done a little gazebo, we're spending the money, there's nothing like rocket science going on, but at least let them know and they'll feel great, they'll love the brand, they'll love the transparency that you have, and we have nothing to hide, so it's like something that the people are afraid, like, like Derek said, when they, when they feel like you're hiding something, you're not being transparent, that's when the problem is, and that communication is just, it just seems so simple, but I guess most of us don't, don't follow through. Does that make sense, Derek? Yeah, it does. And, and I love what you said there in that um, you talked about bringing them to your side. And that's one of the first things that we do in any difficult conversation in any negotiation is, is start working on bringing them to our side. And we start these things out. And I know you mentioned this earlier in the call. We start all difficult conversations out with an accusations audit, right? And we go full bore. We don't stop. We don't stop until they stop us. You know, if so, if you've got 10 accusations audits, I want you to throw all 10 accusations audits out in the front part of that conversation. And I, to the point where the other side, whoa, goes, whoa, 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 whoa. You're being too hard on yourself. Or no, 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 no. We're not thinking about that. That's the first step. That's the first indication that they're willing to step to your side. So can, so you, can you explain to people what an accusation audit is just to get them clear on what it is? Yeah, so the, the accusations audit is you stating a negative before it is spoken by your counterpart. Yeah, this is key, everybody. This is awesome, dude. This is great. It's, it's important for you to assume or speculate the negative opinions, assumptions, and impressions that the other side has about you and to speak those into being before they're spoken by your counterpart. So you would think to yourself, Prior to this difficult conversation, if my counterpart was having a glass of wine with one of their closest friends, what bad things would they be saying about me or this situation or my company? And you start making a list. And at the beginning of that conversation, you thank them for agreeing to meet with you, and then you start hitting them. Give, probably, can you give us an example? You're probably gonna think that I'm being greedy. You may think that we're disorganized. You probably think that this is just a money grab for us. You may think that we don't have a good appreciation on the future of this market. You may think that we're too new to this space to provide you the value that you're looking for. You may be wondering to yourself why you agreed to take this meeting or this phone call in the first place. And you may, be, you may believe that this is a complete waste of time. Does this build rapport? It builds trust yeah. because I think, I think people see that you're being open and transparent, correct? It builds both. It builds rapport first because you are showing a willingness, a willingness to step to their side. And that initiates that rule of reciprocity because you extend the olive branch first, they're more likely to extend it to you when you get to your goal and your objective. And rapport leads to that trust-based influence. Derek, do you have children? I do. How have you used that with your kids? Uh, I use it a lot more now that they're older. They're in their twenties now. Uh, and so their brains are starting to 
realize their full capabilities. <laughs> it's over, right? I feel like it could just crush, you know, push down barriers though, because you know, you might have your defenses up, but you, you keep like bashing yourself and it's like, okay, this guy's very reasonable. I'm going to pull back and let him speak to me now. That's, I, I can see it like easing this situation. Well, he's even on the, uh, that occurs, but there's, there's something that occurs in the brain as well. Um, in any difficult conversation, any conversation where you're driving for a yes, uh, that's a negotiation. I don't care what the yes is about. Um, and driving for a yes means somebody is going to surrender something that makes people defensive. And defense means there's a threat. That's a negative emotion. It fires up the amygdala. The amygdala overrides the, the prefrontal cortex where the processing occurs. And they can't see the forest for the trees. Mm -hmm. So I take care of those negatives first, because at the end of the day, I want my counterpart to be smarter. You want to make your counterpart smarter, dive in on these negatives first, get rid of those, those negative emotions and people studies have shown that people, uh, in a positive frame of mind, their, their brain works up to 31% better when they're in a positive frame of mind. So the accusations audits, make people smart because it attacks the negatives. So you can also use it in real estate where, Hey, I'm selling this deal. Um, I've got some hairy stuff on this. The foundation is not the greatest. The walkway is a little shaky. Um, I, I'm giving them the information in front. I'm not hiding from it. They're going to find out whether they, if they do an inspection. So if you bring that out to them in the front, that might be better. They might think of it positively. And then next time when you negotiate something, you ask for something. It's not as huge of an ask because you've already given them stuff. Is that one way you could use you know, it? You know, hear, hear me out for a second. Guys, I understand that there's a little crack in the foundation. I understand that there's some trees in the back that are overgrowth. I understand that the gutters are filled up we we know that these things are out there let them respond to that and then do you go into the fact and talk about the the positive of it and what they're going to get from it or is that too much too soon it's too much too soon and to the point and and, <laughs> and your and your and, that, and that's you getting in your way because you want that's that's yeah. a natural reaction when we give an accusations audit we immediately want to explain why that is not the case and that's not what we're after too much too soon so first of all jake I understand that blah, blah, blah. I understand that blah, blah, blah. And you've taken the focus off of them and you put it back on who? Mm, on yourself. You. you put it back on yourself because the first three things that came out of your mouth were I understand. Two millimeter shift. I like where you were going with the two millimeter shift is you probably think that this property is a piece of garbage. You probably have questions about the foundation. You may have um, some reservations about um, where the uh, where the surveyor said the lines are, or whatever the case may be. So mm -hmm. it's 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 you may you might you probably because you're, again you're not speaking these as facts and you're not admitting to anything. You're thinking to yourself, this is probably what they're thinking. So I'm going to go ahead and address it. You're not looking for a response. You're not looking for them to say, yes, that's exactly what we were thinking, and, or. No, that's not. Now, if you get the no, that's, that's golden. But the point I'm trying to make is the application of the accusation audit is not to draw a response from the other side. It's just to throw it out there, let it sink in, and then you move on to the next one. Mm -hmm. One thing I learned in coaching school, Jake, was when you say I understand, um, even if you've gone through the same situation as I have, you'll truly never understand how I feel and I'll never truly understand how you feel. So I think the better way to say it is it is understandable that you may feel that way because you don't know how a person feels because we, we, um, we uh, process things completely different. So I totally agree with Derek. It's not about you. It's about me. So it's understandable, not I understand. We always say that. Every, you always hear people saying that, yeah, I know how he feels. No, you don't really know how the person feels because even though you've gone through the same thing, they process things differently. They're a different part in their life. So that's an awesome, that is an awesome point. Jake, I can keep going on. This What's stuff. the transition though from the acquisitions, uh, acquisitions audit? <clears throat> I transition from the accusations audit to a summary. What has brought us to the table? How, how has this relationship progressed? Um, it could be a five-minute relationship. It could be a five-year relationship. But I want to encapsulate how we first met to where we are now. <coughs> Excuse me. And what that does for you is 
it shows the other side that you've got a good grasp of all the nuances of the relationship. And I always finish my summary with, do I have that right? And they will fill in anything that you missed. That human nature response to correct is uh, undeniable. If you're wrong, people love to tell you how to jump. <laughs> they can't wait for you to stop talking so they can jump in and tell you exactly what you missed. So I asked them, Did I, do I have that correct? And I give them a chance. So again, what am I showing? I'm showing deference to their side. I'm showing that I care about how they view things. So with accusations audit summary, um, if you're in a negotiations deal, um, but it hasn't been consummated or you're talking to a prospect, there's a reason why that prospect is talking to you. There's a reason why they took time out of their day to engage you. I want to find out why. Why did you... Why did you agree to take this meeting? Why am I here? Why are you considering changing away from what you're doing now? Why are you considering um, my company? Serves two purposes. Number one, to establish whether or not you're the favorite or the fool in the deal. Are you the favorite or are you the fool? It's important for you to know that early because uh, the only sin to not getting a deal is taking a long time to not get the deal. So if I'm the fool in, a, in an agreement or in, a, in a, a negotiation, I want to know that sooner rather than later. Does this guy really want to do business with me or is he, or is he doing due diligence? Is he trying to give, get me to give him a proposal that he can take to the vendor he really wants? Um, and if you don't know whether or not you're the favorite or the fool, Guess one. Guess which one you probably are. <laughs> mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so the why question will help establish that. If they can come up with a robust response as to all of the um, attributes that make it attractive in engaging me in this conversation, I feel a lot better. If they can't, I know I'm probably the fool. If they come back and say, I don't know, you tell me. That's for you to tell me why, I, why you're here, why you're the best thing since sliced bread. If they give me a response like that, they don't intend on doing business with me. So why did you take the meeting? Why am I here? Why would you change away from the status quo? And then we jump into some information gathering dialogue before I go to my goal and objective. So everybody out there, it's a strategy. There's a framework. You don't just wake up one day and become a great salesperson or great negotiator, correct, Eric? There is a framework that you can follow. Here's the thing. Don't think of it as framework. Think of it as options, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, 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 there's a saying that the best laid battle plans never survive first contact with the enemy, right? Mike Tyson said, everybody's got a plan until they get punched in the mouth. <laughs> um. And human beings are dynamic creatures. So um, I like to think of options as opposed to steps or framework because, you know, your accusations audits may not just be at the beginning of the conversation. You may have to throw them in somewhere in the middle. You're certainly going to throw some in at the very end. Um, your summary, you may have to summarize twice during the course of a negotiation, once at the beginning and then summarize what you guys have talked about for the last 45 minutes before you press on. So it just, it just depends on the nature of the conversation. So don't think of it so much as framework as there are specific options that you can employ. Think about it like a wide receiver. If, if you're out there and you have an option route, they're playing, they're playing you with a little bit of zone. Maybe you, you, the quarterback knows you're going to go and do the hitch. If they're playing up man to man and there's going to be no safety over the top, you're hitting that go route. So it's, it's having that type of, uh, you know, tools in your belt. So, you yeah. know, what's when's this, when it, we're presented with this defense, this is what we're going to employ. And that's almost how I, I'm uh, envisioning this. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 I'm not a, obviously not as versed in football ology. You know, you, you like are. that? The, the little hitch out in the go bank. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> but I see where you're going with it. I see where you're going with it. Um, but yeah, it, it just, it just depends. It just depends. You know, that's what, that was a, uh, that was what was my, one of my buzzwords when I was still in law enforcement. 
um, you know, for the longest time in negotiations, we would say, we're never going to do this. We're never going to do that. We're never going to. And then as we evolved, we knew that things were situational. And so we moved from never to it depends. When am I supposed to do X? It depends. <laughs> I've used that word never as a parent. Six kids, bro, if this thing comes back to bite me every day, <laughs> I'm never going to do that. Yep. I remember the first time, Jake, I got a minivan. This is back in 2000. I said, I'm never going to get a VCR in my car. Mark, my kids ain't watching TV. Pfft, that lasted like a year, bro. And it just goes <laughs> on and on and on. So, no, no, you have to be flexible. Never say never. As an entrepreneur, you need to. Um, before we go to the short answer questions, Derek, I just want to ask you one more question. I mean, what, do you, what do you think is the best negotiating tip for the listeners out there? If they had to focus on one thing in negotiation, what would that be? Um, I would tell you that when you're hit with a question or a statement that doesn't make sense to you or you think there's an ulterior motive to the statement or question, don't answer it. I want you to simply use these words. It seems like you have a reason for asking. It sounds like you have a reason for saying that. You tell me in what conversation those two statements would not be applicable. Because people say things and they're cloaking an ulterior motive or they ask terrible questions. They ask question A when they really want the answer to question B. So before you answer anything, it seems like you have a reason for saying that. It sounds like you have a reason for asking. That's awesome. It sounds like my, my wife's asking me a question. It's really not question A. Wait a second. <laughs> Sounds like there's something behind this. Elaborate on that, please. I love that, dude. That is great. And here's the thing. It, it, delivery is important. Delivery is important. I'm, I'm going to pick with you, Jake, because you said it. It, it. Wait a second. It sounds like something behind that. That is, in essence, what you're saying, but those are not the words I want you to use. I just want That's you to how say I it. use it with my wife, and I get something <laughs> on. So, you know, enlighten me. Expand yeah. my mind here, because I want I want to get out of jail free card here. <laughs> it's 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 playing with the delivery. Your tonality, your delivery, your projected sincerity are more powerful than any tool that you'll ever use. And so, if you're hit with something, you just simply say, "It seems like you have a reason for asking that." Let me try it again, honey. It it seems like. You have a reason for asking that. Could you elaborate? Perfect. Please? No, no, don't don't say could you elaborate. <laughs> don't say <laughs> don't step on it. Shut up, man. You're killing <laughs> Less Red. is more. Less is more, Jake. Yeah, right, shut more. Up. Give it to me one more time. Give it to me one more time here. It seems like you have a reason for asking that. It seems like you have a reason for asking that. I asking that? Asking I want you. <laughs> yes, I want you to inflect upwards it's because be that's like, it's got to be soft. Kid to gloves, a question. You would say, right? Kid gloves. Yeah. It's not the DJ voice, okay? You got to stay away from the late night DJ voice, okay? The positive and playful is good, not really assertive. So I like, I like the second one. That's it's, uh, yeah. You're you're inquisitive and you're and you're and you're playful with it. Just by and and notice that it's not a question. Mm -hmm. Gino, notice it's not a question. It seems like we're gonna take a time out to hear from our sponsor. <laughs> be right back. <laughs> Gino, I know a lot of our listeners are wanting to take their multifamily investing business to the next level. I know that you've been hard at work helping Jake and Gino students do just that using our framework. Can you explain to the listeners how they can get our help? Guys, we've been hard at work growing our community of like-minded investors and the results of our members has been nothing short of incredible. We're looking to grow this amazing group. What we're looking for is those who wanna follow our proprietary framework that we've created. Buy right, manage right, and finance right. Leverage our connections, education, and mentorship as ways to take your business to the next level. So if you're interested in finding out more about how you can become a part of our amazing community, apply to work with us at jakeandgino.com forward slash apply all right gang and we are back so i want to get into the transition a little bit what was the most difficult part about transitioning from government to the private sector and then give us a little bit about the reward as well um it's it's uh, the identity thing that was the most difficult transition i you know i was a cop for almost 30 years you know i i went nowhere 
nowhere without my shield, my credentials, and my weapon. And now I don't do that anymore. And you wonder when you step off the ledge because after 30 years, you've got, a, you've got a certain level of comfort. I know what I was doing. I knew what I was doing as a cop. I knew how to conduct myself. And now I'm going into the private sector, stepping off into the unknown and not being that guy. You know, for years, I was that guy. I was, I was the head of our hostage negotiations team. I was the head of our criminal investigations division which meant that anytime somebody's life went completely sideways, me and my team were the ones that are going to respond to clean it up. We were the people that the police called when the police were faced with the job they couldn't handle, whether it was a, a you know, a child murder or it was a, a barricaded person. So the biggest, the toughest transition for me was not being the guy anymore. Um, and questioning, you know, did you really do the right thing? Um, you know, how are you going to, um, function in a, in a part of society that's less rigid than where you came from. And so that was, uh, that was probably the most difficult. Um, the second part of the question was what was the most rewarding? Mm -hmm. I get to meet a lot of cool people now, you know, there's, there's actually a world outside of law enforcement, <laughs> you know, it, when you're a cop, the only people you talk to are cops. Uh, the only people you associate with outside of the job are cops. And you guys talk a lot, you think a lot, uh, you think alike, you talk a lot and you think alike. And um, I've learned that there's just so much more out there. I've met so many cool people globally uh, as a part of my affiliation with the Black Swan Group um, that I was missing out a lot. Um, I stunted my growth, my learning, um, because I was in an environment that was, that was closed off. And, and I've learned so much in the past um, past two years since I punched out um, from different people, different walks of life. So that's the biggest reward. The cool people who have now stoked my um, desire to keep getting better. Yeah. And the reason we ask is because we have so many students that go from – you know, the, whatever the, the current role that they're in, like Gino is, you know, in the restaurant, we got a lot of guys that come from engineering backgrounds and then they eventually buy enough deals and they leave their jobs and they take on the, the real estate entrepreneur full time. And it's a scary transition. And people are saying, you know, when can I do it? And, and they're wondering, you know, what will it be like? And will I be able to do it? And then they're losing that prior identity. So it's a big transition shift that we see with a lot of folks that we associate with. So that was, that was a great answer. Uh, you, you touched on learning. Is there a, a book recommendation out there that you want to to, to the uh, audience? Um, to Sell is Human, Daniel Pink. Um, ah. He does, he's, uh, he's, he's got a big brain. And, <laughs> and he's, he's good at putting pen to paper and helping those involved in sales. Um, that would be, probably top of my list as far as uh, negotiation and selling is concerned. Um, and a leadership book, it would be Extreme Ownership by uh, Jocko Willink. Oh, Got to get to that one. And late get to that one. Good stuff. Folks listening to this, you've, you've given so much valuable content. Um, but if you know, someone's winding this down and they may be going through a negotiation right now, they haven't got any prior training on negotiation, what's one thing that you can tell them, don't make this mistake going into it? You know, if they're, if they're going to negotiate their next real estate deal, if there's one common pitfall that you see time and time again. Is there any nugget or tidbit that you can give to the folks and say, don't do this, we see this happen a lot? You know what I'm going to tell you? What What's I told that? you at the beginning of this call. Sequencing, sequencing, sequencing. Forget about where you want to end up. When you are solely focused on where you want to end up, you're missing valuable pieces of information. You're not even getting the bat off your shoulders and the pitches are going right by you because you're so focused on where you want to end up. And so I, I want your folks that are listening to this to think about their counterparts in these deals as hostage takers and you are the hostage negotiator and you are in the middle of a hostage negotiation. If you handle your counterpart with the same level of thoughtfulness and deference that hostage negotiators do hostage takers, 
you're going to be way ahead of the game because at the end of the day, it's not about you. It's about them. The sooner you convey that message, the more progress you're going to make. And I know, Jake, a lot of people don't think of it that way. <laughs> Just sum it a damn deal. We gotta, ready, sometimes we got to downshift, right? You know, we got to slow it down. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, and that's what it's all about, slowing it down. We intentionally slow you, slow you down to speed you up. Mm-hmm. We slow you down to speed you up. Jake, I have to say this. I just had an epiphany right now. Um, Bob Berg's The Go-Giver. This is why it, the go-giver mentality is so amazing. And people, it's hard when you're trying to pay the bills because it's all about you. When you can focus as a salesperson on the other side, just what Derek is talking about, amazing things happen to you. All of a sudden, you have these opportunities coming out there and you're servicing others and you're helping others and you're sh- teaching others and you're giving yourself to others. And all of a sudden, they want to give back to you because they know you're genuine. They know there's no, you're, you're not coming with an angle, right? That was just an epiphany to me. So everyone out there has got to read the, the book, The Go-Giver by Bob Burke because it's amazing. It's what Good Derek has conveyed to because the sales guy in the beginning is like, I got to make the sale. I, I got to sell this to this guy. And, and But really, really, that's what the guy cares about. The guy cares about the <laughs> product. So that was just an epiphany. I was really, wow, that was cool. That was awesome. That's good. Derek, what's the best way for folks to get a hold of you? BlackSwanLTD.com. Uh, hit that uh, URL and uh, you'll find a link that'll get uh, an email directly to me. Um, and of course, you can find the book on Amazon, Ego Authority Failure. Awesome. And definitely check that one out. G-Dad, what you got? There's a lot, man. We can keep going on for like another three hours on this, Jake. This has been freaking awesome. I mean, I mean, Derek, so- now, now Derek's feeling like a hostage over here. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. You know, I, as I told you, I enjoy, I enjoy sharing. You know, I'm, I'm trying to to, to make people better. I'm trying to get better myself. And, uh, I, I enjoy, uh, putting our stuff out there because I know that it's going to accelerate their, their business deals. Mm-hmm. Um, that's what we're all about. Um, and you know, we can't go on for three hours today, but you guys just <laughs> say the word, you say the word, I'll come back. <laughs> well, I mean, information's key. Communication, um, I think the sequencing, sequencing, sequencing is really huge. Read the Bob Burke because it's all about the go-giver. Um, I think the accusation audit is great. Um, the tactical empathy, go in it. I mean, Chris has got a great book too. We've, we've had him on the show a couple of times. You know, you got to read that book. That book is, is awesome. Um, I like the three types of negotiators. Go through that again. Just, you know, listen to this podcast a couple of times because you're going to hear stuff second and third time that you didn't hear the first time. And, and I'm telling you, take a pen and paper out and take notes because it's going to be, there's a lot of value information in here. And like Jake said, He's going 150 miles an hour. Slow it down and find out what the other side needs. You know what you need, but find out what the other side needs and see how you can solve that that problem. Yeah, and not only what they need, but why they need it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. All righty, gang. If you found value in today's show, please get over to iTunes. Leave us a review. Give us the the five stars. And Derek, we really appreciate your time today. Thanks, Thanks, Derek. Appreciate it. Gino, take care, buddy. Talk to you soon.